What's going on? Welcome to another video. This is a long video. You know how these get long? I meant to have this uploaded last Wednesday or Thursday, but I get sidetracked. I get a phone call, I get a something or other, and I get sidetracked and it, the video gets put off to the next day and the next day. And how they get longer is, if I come in in the morning and I've got time, I just add another story to the video and they just get longer and it works really well. So this is a great, this, this video is packed with six or seven really cool stories. At the end, we've got birthday wishes. I hope you enjoy it. I'm gonna flip up a picture of one of our latest t-shirts here. It's our Halloween limited edition t-shirt. It's just one design, but I think it is so cool. It's this Bigfoot standing at your doorway with a little trick or treat bag. I hope you guys like it. And if you're interested in it, Look at our Teespring store. There's a link in the description. I think there's a little store thing that should be scrolling past right under this video. And we've got all kind of other t-shirts. You know, I don't take donations on anything. I pay for everything myself. I don't expect you to pay for anything or give me donations just because I do YouTube. That is so stupid. So I don't take donations, but I do sell t-shirts and you get something in return. So all the new people who are tuning in and listening to the channel, there have been a few over the last couple of three weeks. I do not take donations. I will never take donations. I don't need your money, don't want your money, but I will sell you a t-shirt. Now, how's that? I hope you all enjoy this video and let's get rolling with it. All right, here we go. <laughs> Here's an email from Ray. Here's what he writes. I've been deliberating about sending my story for quite a while, and I finally got up the nerve to go ahead and send it. I'm glad you did, Ray, because this is really a good one. This is really interesting. I guess my story really starts when I was a little boy. My dad took my brother and I on multiple fishing trips and camping trips. We were never hunters because my mom didn't feel comfortable with guns and my dad always was sensitive to her request. But we were always outside and enjoyed the outdoors. When we were kids, he would take us out to the Mississippi River Valley area, which is close to Bellevue, Iowa. I think it was pool number 11. We would spend weekends there in our pop-up camper. Across the river, there was an army depot and trespassing was forbidden. But when the water was high, we could get a rented boat in there and fish that area. As long as we were not standing on ground, we were legal. We would always hear strange noises, things that we couldn't explain, and big splashes that my dad would say were beavers. As I got older, I started camping and going fishing out there on my own. And of course, you get smarter and used to the wildlife when you're not a little kid. And you realize that beavers don't make that loud of a splash. While camping there as a kid back in the mid-70s, we would have things thrown into camp. And we also heard strange noises coming from the woods that surrounded us. I remember a few nights when we were awakened by those noises we never knew what they were. In later years, I became more interested in bass fishing. I competed in several tournaments. This is where my story begins as far as my encounter goes. I was fishing a bass tournament on the Mississippi River around the Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois area. It was late spring and we were fishing a qualifying tournament. I was considered a boater and I had drawn a partner that was a non-boater and we were heading out on the second day of a three-day tournament. I had the basic equipment, a 19-foot bass boat with a 175-horse Johnson on the back, and I had all the gear. This was in the early 2000s, and GPS was not standard equipment at that time. We decided to run down the river to find cleaner water. We were after largemouth because they're bigger fish and they weigh more, and the smallmouth bite was non-existent at this time. The Mississippi River is a vast system, and the backwaters and tributaries that run along the river are immense. We had decided to make a run south on the river and lock down to another pool. When we finally got to the area that we decided to fish, we had to navigate very carefully. Maps were unreliable due to the water level, and again, we didn't have GPS. 
To get to the area we wanted to fish, we had to go underneath a railroad trestle, or bridge if you will, but because the river was up at the time, we had to actually take the boat plug out and fill the boat with water so that our bass boat would sit low enough to fit under this bridge. Once we were past the bridge, we would bilge the water out. I know that sounds crazy, but when you're after fish and you're that driven, sometimes you do stupid things. In hindsight, maybe it wasn't the brightest thing to do, but I had actually learned the trick watching Bassmaster TV. After we made our way around through the back area, we found a great spot with clear water that we wanted to fish. My partner had fished it before, and he said it was for sure a good spot and that we should catch a limit. The lily pads were just coming up, and the vegetation was reaching the surface. It was a little bit late in the spring, so there was still some spawning going on, but mostly post-spawn, and the bass started hitting top water through the pads. The bank was mainly rock and sand, and behind that was a dense forest. We were sitting in a nice little stretch all to ourselves, and we had a lot of water to fish. It was going to take us hours to cover this area. We were stoked, and we started fishing, trolling at a steady pace with topwater baits. Fifteen minutes later, my partner put a 17-inch fish in the boat, and by 8.30 a.m., we both had our limits. After that, we started culling fish. It was a perfect day. At around 9.30, I was pulling us up to a bank that we hadn't fished, and we heard some clacking like rocks being clapped together. We assumed it was someone working on a project out of our view. But as we came around a slight bend, we saw a dark figure standing on the bank. We thought it was a bear. It was hard to make out. It really didn't look like a bear, but nothing else made sense, even though they are rare in this area. It was frolicking on the bank. It was weird. It looked like it was gathering mussels or crawfish and having a great time at it. We just sat in the boat and watched it. As we approached this animal, we really couldn't make out what it was still because we couldn't see its head. Soon we were close enough that it hurt us and it stood up. This thing was huge, standing there with water dripping from its black hair. I couldn't believe how big this thing was. We now knew it was not a bear. My partner and I looked at each other, and basically without even saying a word, we understood the look of, what in the hell is this thing? I was on the front deck high above the water working the trolling motor. We stopped fishing, of course. Bigfoot never entered my mind at this point. I had only heard of Bigfoot from pieces on TV. And then this creature started wading into the water towards us. Apparently, it had some rocks in its hands, and it threw at us two times. One of those rocks landed in the boat. It was now swimming towards us. It was at least 100 feet away, and we were in five feet of water. Where this thing was, the water had to have been about the same depth, so I don't know why it started swimming. It could have walked all the way to us and never had water to its waist, but it was swimming. The noises it made while swimming were so strange. It was a huffing sound that I had never heard anything like before. It sounded very deep and angry. It was time to go because he was closing the distance on us fast. We both dropped down into the seats and I fired the outboard up. Thank God it cranked on the first turn and I dropped it into gear. The sound of the outboard apparently persuaded the creature to stop its advance because it turned and made its way back to the bank. I wanted to slow down and watch this thing some more, but I figured we better get moving, so we motored out of the area. I got a bit concerned when we reached the railroad trestle, but we got back under it the same way that we got in, and then we kept moving. We still had a lot of daylight left, and we should have wanted to keep fishing, but this ordeal kept our minds occupied so that we couldn't concentrate on what we were doing. We stopped and ate lunch, and we talked about the whole thing for an hour before heading back to the ramp. We both had our limits, and we qualified for the next tournament. I was real happy about that for sure. I never ran into that guy again in any of the tournaments I fished afterwards, so we never kept in touch, and of course I haven't talked to him since. 
I kept the whole thing quiet for years, only to tell a couple of close friends later on. I figured whoever I relayed this story to would think I was nuts. And I don't know if the partner that day ever told anyone or if he even remembers it. I still fish every chance I get, but I don't fish tournaments much. I'm in my 50s now, and I will never forget that fishing trip as long as I live. After that experience, I look back at my youth on the same river, and I wonder if those things that we used to hear when we were kids were these same creatures. I used to fish a lot in southeastern part of Oklahoma, and we've experienced other strange things while fishing, but I never had a sighting or can confirm anything but strange things or sounds. Bass fishing is a serious sport, and I'm just curious if your viewers out there have had similar events. I'm quite sure that I'm not the only one that has experienced something similar while fishing. I would be really curious to see if anyone maybe would respond and tell their story too because I just find it hard to believe that I'm the only one that this has happened to while fishing. The places we fish, especially in the southern reservoirs as well as the Mississippi River, where there is so much shoreline and deep woods, I think these creatures use these rivers and tributaries as pathways or roads in a way to migrate. I don't really know. I'm no expert, but it just makes sense to me. I hope you enjoyed my story and you can use it and some other fishermen might share theirs. Once again, keep up the good work. I really enjoy your channel and it helped me sort this out and deal with what I experienced. Ray, that's a great story. I actually have one of the, a video, uh, I have a video up that has a story in it that is real similar to this. And I think the guy was on Tunica Cutoff or Flower Lake right south of Memphis. He was uh, fishing in some flooded timber, uh, actually running spinnerbaits around cypress knees and stuff like that. And he, up uh, the, the water, uh, the trees cleared out and it got clear and there was a bank up, a muddy bank. And he saw a Bigfoot uh, rolling around in the mud, cloaking itself in mud. Some people said it was they do that to keep bugs off of them and stuff. I don't know. The kid, the guy was a teenager. I don't remember the story exactly, but I'll tell you what, at the end screen, I'll pop it up at the end screen and you guys can uh, listen to that if you're interested in these fishing stories. But Ray, this is a great story, man. I really appreciate it. And thanks for sending it, buddy. Here is a, a message I got on Facebook. Now, look, I don't really, I don't know why, but I just don't check my Facebook inbox that much. I do sometimes, and I'm able to respond to people. I've got a whole folder full of Facebook encounter stories, and this is one of them, and I'm going to try to start going through those. Some of them are pretty short, but they're just fantastic, uh, like this one. I think I got this one back in April of 2019. Here's what the writer says. He wants to be anonymous. It was around September or October of 1970. My battalion had been activated to go to Vietnam, and we were doing some intense training to get ready. The training was taking place in heavily forested areas of Fort Jackson, South Carolina. It was dark that night, and my platoon was on the left flank of the main body, and we were moving to attack and capture the aggressor force opposing us. I was a PFC at the time, and I was a squad leader. Orders came down for my squad to move up and scout ahead of the main body. We were moving from tree to tree slowly and as quietly as possible. I moved ahead to this really large tree and I got down to a prone position and I listened. All I could hear was silence. There were no bugs, no frogs, nothing. I put my hand down to push up to my feet and all hell broke loose. What I had put my hand down on was a booger's foot. He roared so loudly I couldn't hear for the next 15 minutes. I shot up and I backed up, shouting for the rest of the squad to retreat, all the while firing my M16. Don't worry, they weren't live rounds, they were blanks. With all the noise and my entire platoon racing towards me, the booger took off, crashing through the woods. After everything had quieted down, you could see the destruction it had made getting the hell out of there. Later, after a bunch of guys all dressed in black showed up asking a lot of questions, taking some measurements and who knows what else, 
I found out that the bugger was 8 foot 11 inches tall, and they said it weighed around 900 to 1,000 pounds. Looking back, I don't think it was there to hurt anyone. It was just curious. Uh, and then he signs off and says, please don't reveal my name. That's no problem, brother. Man, what a story. <laughs> what a story. I hear I get a lot of these stories of these things actually inhabiting the forests that surround military bases. And I think there's probably a lot of stories out there of guys in the military, you know, the actual grunts that do the fighting, out doing training and running into these things. We hear of them a lot, but I bet there's more out there. Anyway, I appreciated this story. It's really good. Really good. Thanks for sending it, brother. Okay, let's take a break from the stories, and I'm going to read you guys an email. And what this email entails is uh, one man's opinion about something about Bigfoot. And I think these are interesting. And if you guys have opinions on some of these things, and if they're different, something different that's that's not prevalent in the constant same old stuff talked about in the Bigfoot world, uh, I'd be interested in reading it and maybe putting it in a video, but I think this is interesting, so I'm going to share it with you. The email is from Keith. Keith lives in the UK. He says, I listen to your stories every day. I'm retired, and I've got plenty of time on my hands. I never had an experience with Bigfoot, and I don't expect I ever will, at least not where I live, but after listening to you recount many stories, I'd like to share my thoughts with you. You may or may not have read the books by Carlos Castaneda. In case you haven't, Castaneda's mentor was a Yaqui Indian named Don Juan, and he taught Castaneda sorcery, at least that's what he called it, to begin with. This was to grab Castaneda's attention. But later he called it knowledge. The second book Castaneda wrote, there are ten of them, is entitled A Separate Reality. The key to these realities is the ability to stop the internal dialogue, or in other words, the constant chit-chat of thought. If you think about it, we never stop thinking. Even when we are sleeping, our minds are active. Apparently, when we stop this internal dialogue, we open the door to new realities and abilities. So many of the anomalies surrounding the Bigfoot experience are almost identical to the experiences Don Juan put Castaneda through, like being frozen to the spot or the feeling of being ill or the now you see me, now you don't type thing that Bigfoot displays. I can't help thinking that due to the fact that Bigfoot doesn't have the distractions of the modern world to fill his or her mind, he or she has these abilities that Don Juan taught Castaneda. I don't think they come from other dimensions. Rather, I think some of them have mastered the art of stopping the world, as Don Juan calls it. In other words, stopping thinking, and they can therefore jump from one dimension to another. The reason I think this is because there are videos of mother Bigfoots with young ones. If they did come from another dimension, why on earth would they bring their kids with them? That doesn't make sense to me, so I think it's more a case that they're from our world but can jump into another dimension when cornered. At least some of them have this ability. Uh, and then he goes on to write, keep the, keep the stories coming, buddy. And by the way, I love your accent. <laughs> I, I, Oh man, this accent thing. This is this is a big deal to to some people. I don't know why, but it's just the way we talk down here, so I can't disguise it. Anyway, this was an interesting email, and it's not so much uh that it has to do with Bigfoot, but it intrigues me about this this idea of being able to stop thinking. I mean, think about that. We're, our minds are working all the time. They're ne they never stop working. I never stop thinking. I think all the time. And I wonder what it would be like to just, in a conscious way, remain conscious and stop thinking, go into such a deep meditative state that you actually stop thinking and kind of go blank for a few minutes. Would you stop breathing? Would your heart, would your involuntary organs stop beating like your heart? Would you stop breathing? I don't think so. They're involuntary, so, but I don't know. I just don't know what that would lead to, but it is a fascinating concept. 
sometimes I, I've read a few things about this remote viewing phenomenon that I think even our military has used where people, I'm not even sure exactly what it is. That's how dumb I, that's what a moron I am with this stuff. I don't, it's, I just don't have time to read up on it, but it's interesting stuff to me. And I, I, I myself would love to be able to just shut my mind down, man, just for 15 minutes a day, that would be fantastic. And I wonder if I did, could I transport myself to another place? Maybe not physically, but psychologically go to another place. I don't know if that's a, 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 a even feasible or not, but the whole concept is fascinating. And if it has to do with Bigfoot, it would make perfect sense. Now, here's the thing. We can all have opinions on any of this stuff because none of us know anything about Bigfoot. And if you think you do know something, you really don't. You really don't. You're just acting like you do because we, we don't know anything about these things. And all opinions and ideas are up in the air. I mean, we can come up with anything we want. This one seems very interesting to me. Hope you guys enjoyed his theory. And uh, let's move on to another story. Thanks, Keith, for sending the email. Here's an email from a gentleman in Arkansas. He wants to be a anonymous, but he says, uh, I dedicate this true tale to Zana. Zana, probably uh, perfectly mispronounced by me, whom I have not met, but whom who I've spoken to on the telephone. She's an employee at the VA hospital in the lesser known Fayetteville area where I go for medical reasons. I'm sure to be nearing the end of my days on earth and surely soon to meet my maker. I will not lie about that. And lying was never my habit. I can shoot the bull, but I'm well known to be an overly serious type person. I'm just a bit strange. I am by birth a Texas native. I have two roll numbers in the Cherokee tribe and descended from a Scottish blacksmith indentured servant who came early to America and later became wealthy. I was a mere weed, yet I can truly claim great roots, but many burnt leaves. My family fought our British brothers and on both sides of our civil war, and I am second cousin to the man in black, Mr. Johnny Cash. I'm grateful and proud and unashamed Southerner and a proud American. I was also a military brat and later a Navy veteran. Being a military child, I was raised for 11 and a half years in the shadow of SAC, the former Strategic Air Command. I volunteered right out of high school and joined the Navy, which should have been a career move but turned out to be rather abbreviated. As that U.S. Air Force brat, I have an interesting and true story of a SAC nuke base that was commandeered in 1952 by the things that we call UFOs. It changed a lot of people's minds and thinkings, but I will get to that at the end of my letter. For nine years, I lived in the Pacific Northwest and certainly loved it. Times were tough, but I was able to be employed with the U.S. Forestry Service during part of that sojourn. I was young. I knew many government forestry personnel, landowners, loggers, hunters, and fishermen, and a lot of them had personal testimonies of Bigfoot. So does the U.S. Air Force Survival School in Northeast Washington State. Personally, I spent every free moment I could get in those forested mountains and trudged up and down them carrying land surveying equipment and personal gear. For better or worse, while I certainly had my own share of harrowing adventures and scares, I not once encountered a Sasquatch, even though living actively right in the middle of their habitat, and I didn't have a clue as to them being any more than folklore. I ended up back down south during the toughest of economic times and in a sad and unfulfilled state of mind, and with very empty pockets. I had also just lost everything that I had gained in the Northwest. Twice now, I have had the pleasure to return to Arkansas to live. Presently, I live in Northwest Arkansas. Decades ago, I had a few acres of woods adjoining the Wachita National Forest in Montgomery County, west of Hot Springs. It is right across the highway from the lake of the same name. That would be Lake Wachita. 
It didn't take long, though, to discover the real reason why the former owner, a retired Social Security judge, gave me such a great deal on this land. He even threw in a decent boat, motor, and trailer in trade for me doing the survey. He and his wife just wanted to get it sold. Perhaps the missus couldn't tolerate the woods. Some city folk are bothered by that. They were not ever going to live there again. They moved back to the city, and I soon learned why. The judge and the missus had a well on the property, but it was awful. It was greasy water, almost unusable. Mobile homes are not such bad choices for a dwelling, as long as you don't stick it in a park with a thousand other such contraptions. The electromagnetic attraction or the collection of weirdos in them may be too much for a tornado to resist. I suspect tornadoes are under some degree of control by normally unseen forces. That is what makes me a bit of a weirdo. Hey man, don't talk about the trailer parks. You mess with me, you messing with the whole trailer park. On the back of this house, the judge had had a nice deck installed. He even planned to have a rock garden. Rocks are about the only thing that will grow in that bit of red clay and is continually producing chunks of quartz that just works up out of the ground despite gravity and is surely the result of the Earth's rotation. Maybe. Or perhaps it was the aluminum roof on the mobile home. It created a sort of hell since he had located it hanging over a hill but under one gigantic old oak tree. That tree produced the largest acorns I've ever seen, and a lot of them. Acorns drop from oak trees, this one in profusion. Sleep was not easily obtained. Worse, the area has or had an odd propensity to echo the slightest sounds. A seasoned one-pound acorn falling on a metal roof from near 70 feet produces a loud bang. A continuous barrage produces a resounding din of racket. One could go insane from that alone. Perhaps that was enough to make anyone sell out fast and to make such a sweet deal to the unknowing buyer. They had that decent old bass and ski boat, though. They could at least go fishing often across the highway in Lake Wachita. And there were the deer and the squirrels. It was a hunting and fishing heaven but I heard they spent an inordinate amount of time away from the property. To be candid, after I bought it, so did I. In order to make the payments, and as there were few jobs that I could take locally, I went into long-haul trucking. I got to be home for a couple of days every three weeks. What a lonely occupation. Still, it paid the bills and provided a home for my ailing and aged parents, who at first thought it was a genuine godsend. We all thought so briefly, and we tried to make it a home. Soon, my only sibling showed up and presumed to help out and keep an eye on them. I got to use my bedroom, which overhung the hill, only occasionally, but for several reasons, huge acorns and being addicted to diesel vibrations, I slept often in my truck sleeper, even though I was home. I knew of the large numbers of deer in the area, as well as the usual small bear, cougar, bobcats, etc. Yet on the two trails that ran the length of the property below and on either side of the hill, I seldom found deer tracks or any other tracks for that matter, but they showed what I thought was some kind of heavy use, hard clay and rock. Not the best sort of ground for detecting the sort of game that used it. I passed it off as a minor mystery, unworthy of much thought, which proved to be my mistake. My plot of dirt and rocks was heavily wooded with pines, dogwood, and large oaks. Dead leaves were a problem in the yard area. The trees certainly bothered my elderly mother, and they bothered my dad for entirely different reasons. She and my brother were persuaded by a local lumberman in my absence that the pine beetle had begun destroying my pines. She was promised an undisclosed amount of money and the promise to clean up all of the mess of slash left behind. I note that it was not her decision to make, but I had no idea of the denuded property until I drove in one weekend. Lots of oaks and dogwoods remained, but the pines were gone. 
I was enraged, but what could I do? Nothing. And the slash from the logging was later cleaned up by myself, my old father, and my brother. The pines went into furniture frames. They were gone, and I was sick about it. I had noticed every warm night on the weekends that I was home and I slept with my windows wide open that I would be awakened around 11 p.m. by a quiet giggling or baby talk sound seeming to come from either side of the hill but moving from the U.S. Forest Service area down towards Lake Wachita across the highway. Strange enough, I thought, but I had no idea what to think and oddly thought it was some unknown behavior of other wildlife, probably deer. I don't know why I assumed that. I observed that the unusual and mysterious sounds could be followed beyond my hearing, tracing them by the barking and baying of distant neighbors' dogs. I knew the area well enough that those deer, it's okay to laugh at my deer theory, were going down to the lake to drink and or bathe. Sure enough, the distant barking would resume around 2 a.m., and I could trace their progress back towards my place, back up the trails, and again toward and into the Wachita National Forest. My father liked to rise early and retire around sunset with a glass of iced tea out on the deck. Often we would sit and chat about nothing and the work that we had all done that day. Several times, however, he'd remarked about how he thought he was being spied on by a big, hairy, camouflaged neighbor hiding behind the trees out past our property lines. And sure enough, one evening, I thought, too, that I saw the fellow. Sometimes he would sway left to right, but usually he seemed to peer from behind the trees. Once I walked out there with my rifle, hoping to have a more friendly encounter with the shy, strange visitor, but he would seem to melt into the forest before I arrived to where he or it was. By then, I was totally unsure of my old pop's vision and sanity, but wrote it off as my father's imagination. This, too, was a mistake. My brother, who occupied a 16-foot travel trailer out by the Forest Service line, was, however, terrified. He seldom spoke of it, but had begun to keep his rifle at the ready and claimed that someone was pounding on and jarring his trailer at night, sometimes scratching on the walls. He later built a large fire pit and began keeping a large fire all night, almost every night. He was a heavy drinker, though, and I chalked it up to his being a drunk. This assumption was also a mistake. One warm night with a full moon in 1991, I laid in my room with the windows open. Sleep was difficult due to the bombardment of acorns on the roof. We were exhausted from cleaning up the logging slash left behind by the crooked logger. I must have been leery about something because I was sleeping with my loaded 357 Magnum under the sheets on the pillow next to me along with our three-legged orphaned tomcat. Oh, the things that can happen on a full moonlit night. Unfortunately, until I recently learned of nasal strips, I had a monstrous snoring problem. I could rattle the windows. How anyone or anything could sleep near me was a mystery in itself. But that night, that strange cat had decided to sleep right next to me. I don't remember the actual time, but it was late. The old tomcat awoke me with a terrified caterwaul like I had never heard. He was arched up like a Halloween cat and his tail was fully bushed out in sheer terror. And as he was screaming at the door, he was also hosing a horrible smelling stream of something onto my pillow. The cat was in a state of fear unlike anything I had ever seen. I looked at the door, which had a one-foot square window, and simultaneously reached for and cocked my revolver. Filling that window was the biggest, hairiest man I had ever seen. I drew a bead on his head. I was scared, and I was pulling the trigger, about to send a hollow-point bullet blasting through that window right into the face of that creature, which by then I knew from its moonlit features was merely holding a near-human but huge hand to its face in an attempt to see just what in the hell was making that god-awful noise inside that metal house. 
Mere seconds passed as this encounter transpired, perhaps split seconds. The creature surely realized it was in trouble. It threw up its extra long arms as it turned and ran, screaming, very ape-like, flailing its arms and running for the Forest Service woods. I could see this creature quite well in the light of the full moon. In retrospect, I'm glad to not have shot it. It was as terrified as me and the three-legged cat, which had continued squalling and bolted screaming from the room, still hosing down its full path with that ungodly smelling liquid. It took days of hard cleaning to remove that odor. There are a few things that I am certain of. The creature was screaming in fear as he ran from danger. However, I'm positive he was cursing me for all that he was worth. The logging slash he had run through was more than likely unpleasant and aggravated him even more. Before the erroneous logging operations, they were familiar with the woods of my newly acquired property. At that moment, he had no time to be careful. He just had to go. What I experienced that night was a huge, humanoid, bipedal, hairy ape man, one who was certainly capable of animal and human-like thinking. I finally realized why the old Social Security judge was so eager to sell out. It was all very clear at that point. The creature was roughly 9 to 12 feet tall, likely weighing in at 800 pounds. Long, stringy, dark hair covered its body. I could not detect any odor over the horrid stench from that three-legged tomcat. It had to be that tall in order to bend over the railing on the porch and have its face against my window. That end of the mobile home was perched over the side of a hill, right under that big oak tree. I'm a very good observer, generally speaking. I was good at shooting down aircraft and other military targets while in the Navy, as a member of the U.S. government survey crew and a Forest Service cartographer and a military recon photo analyst, I know how to gather pertinent details. There are not half a dozen folk anywhere in the nation with whom I have told these things to, and in such detail. The usual response is total disbelief and all that anyone could spin such a tale, but I have indeed had a somewhat interesting life. Some have said I should write a book. Others simply dread to get me started. So I normally keep it all to myself and really have few associates these days. I failed earlier to relate that while I personally had no Sasquatch or Bigfoot experiences in the Northwest, I personally knew reputable and sane, even highly educated people who had experienced such encounters. Most were harmless, but some encounters were malevolent in nature. From my acquaintances in all the Pacific Northwest who have had such experiences, I have concluded that said creature is family-oriented and indeed raise and populate the world in areas where they find comfort and sustenance much like us, but they choose to generally observe us and avoid us at all costs. If possible, and by all means, we should be aware of them, but also avoid them if possible. I was once an avid outdoorsman. I love to camp, fish, and hunt, but I will not go into the forest to stay overnight now unless equipped with at least the largest boar weapon available. Anything less, if used in defense, will merely enrage the wounded creature. The smallest creature ever reported is capable of ripping the largest and strongest human male to shreds in seconds, and you just may become dinner. I knew well a devout Christian family, all highly educated in Washington State. They were not known to lie or embellish. They had close, regular exposure to families of these creatures. That was adjacent to the U.S. Air Force Survival School in the mountains of northeast Washington State above Cusick, Washington. The Air Force made pilots parachute into those mountains to survive or die and were not allowed to have any human contact until the course was terminated. There's no telling the stories that those flyers could tell or the instructors who manned the school. My Arkansas experience. My small wooded plot was adjacent to the Wachita National Forest. Not so much as a fence separated it. There are many natural caves above my old property. 
Also, all throughout that region are crystal mines, many not yet operative. Anyone or any creature can definitely make any number of those home if needed. And that's the end of the story, and that's quite a descriptive email about an encounter and several people that he's known that have had encounters. And it's all, it all kind of lines up with everything that normally we get with these encounters. These things aren't after people, not necessarily. They're just, I think they're just really curious. But I appreciate the writer for sending this in. It was a joy to read, and it was really well written, and I know we all enjoyed it. I appreciate you. Here's another Facebook story I got back uh, six or maybe eight months ago. Again, I don't check Facebook much, but this was a really good one, and I wanted to share it with you. And here's what the woman writes. She says, I'm 78 years old, and I have trouble typing and even speaking, but I have a few stories that I wanted to share with you and your audience. I'm not a good writer, and I'm hoping that you can share these encounters. My husband's name is Roger, and my name is Diane. Miss Diane, I was able to edit your message here and create a story out of this. It's all exactly as you wrote it. I think these events are awesome. She writes, these are the stories my husband has told me. My husband lived in LaSalle, Utah with his grandfather on a large ranch. They raised pigs there, among other livestock. Often they would kill a few pigs for their own meat and hang them in a smokehouse on the ranch. My husband told me that when he was a little boy, he remembers times when his grandfather would get angry because the roof of the smokehouse would be torn off and all the meat would be gone. Only the roof would be damaged. All the walls and doors would remain intact. His grandfather would repair the roof and begin smoking more meat, only to have it destroyed again not long after, and of course all the meat would be gone. No other animal, not even grizzlies, will rip a roof off of a 10 to 12 foot tall smokehouse when they can just as easily tear through the wall or the door. Going through the roof would have been too much work for a bear. No other wildlife does this. It had to have been Bigfoot. I think they tore the roof off and reached down into the house, took the meat, and were gone. Another story my husband told me. Still on my grandfather's place in LaSalle, we had a terrifying encounter. In 1942, I was five years old. On the ranch, we had no electricity or running water. So to get water, we walked down to the creek and had to haul the water back to the house. I walked with my older sisters down to the bank one morning, and we were filling buckets and setting them on the bank when we heard something coming down the wash. We got very still to make sure that we were not hearing things, and I remember my oldest sister cupping her hand over my mouth so that I would not make any noise. I saw her nod to our other sister and then motion for her to quickly get out of the creek. I was so young that I didn't know what was going on, but I knew the situation was urgent. I could feel their fear. My oldest sister let go of me and reached down the bank to pull her sister out of the creek, and I remember they both scurried up in front of me. I was trying my best to keep up, but the bank was too steep and I began to slide back down. I felt a hand grip around my arm and my sister pulled me violently to the top. We crawled a few feet to hide behind some brush and we got real quiet. I was in front of my sister and her hand was again across my mouth to keep me from making any noise. The loud footsteps got closer and closer and I was terrified. To me, a monster was coming and I remember praying that it didn't see us. We were a few feet away from the edge of the bank so that the water was not in our line of sight. We could only hear the creature as it approached. It was in front of us now, splashing through the water and rocks, but I had to see it. So I wrenched myself loose from my sister and I crawled just a couple of feet closer to the ledge to see better and what I saw scared me to death. The image is burned into my mind all these years later. The beast walked past and never noticed us, but it was enormous. It really was a monster. Under one arm was another animal that it had killed. It was dragging another with its other arm. I don't know what they were, possibly deer or elk, and the lifeless heads hung and dangled under the dead weight. 
I think if I had been older, I would have recognized the carcasses, but I was so fixated on the creature that I paid no notice to those details. I wasn't being observant of the creature's details either. I think I was so shocked that I just kept quiet and watched it walk by. Once it was past us and a good ways down the creek, I saw it climb the opposite bank and then it was gone. I wish I could relate the details about the creature, but at that age, I didn't know how to do that. All I know is that to me, it was a mountain of a creature and it was covered in dark, shaggy hair. My sisters made us sit there for a few minutes to make sure that it was gone, and then we ran back to the house without the buckets. I remember them telling my mother the whole story. All my mother said was for us to be more careful next time and to go back down there and get those buckets. She needed the water. She wasn't being mean about it. She just didn't believe the story. The next event happened while I was with my husband. This is not a Bigfoot encounter, but it is just as scary. It was either 1967 or 68, and my husband and I had been to Big Creek on that summer day, and we had fished all day from the bank. It was always a great time for us, and I loved going with him. When it was too dark to see, we packed his gear up and loaded the car. I loved the drive home with the windows down and the cool night air blowing through the car. We talked and we talked. The drive home was almost 70 miles, and the halfway point was the summit of Monte Cristo Mountain. If the sky was clear, we would pull over at a clearing at the summit, and he and I would sit on the hood of the car and watch stars for a while. There was not as much light pollution in those days, and a billion stars blanketed the black sky. It was a sight to see. My husband drew my attention to and pointed to an area of the sky. It was a dark spot. Something appeared to be blocking our view of the stars in this one location. It was perfectly round. Stars were everywhere, and one round dark spot with no stars. It was very strange. A few minutes later, we saw lights begin to come from the blacked-out area of the sky. They were like small pen lights growing and moving in random motions coming towards us. It was hard to see, and it took us a minute to realize that the lights were headed our way. At the last minute, we both jumped from the hood and quickly got in the car. It was time to go. But the lights were on us, flying around the car and underneath the car. They were everywhere. My husband turned the ignition and the car battery barely turned the engine over. He tried again and the battery still chugged at the engine, but finally it started. He backed us up to the highway and off we went down Monte Cristo with those lights following us. Some were still with us and I could see several right outside my window. Some flew through the open glass in his side and they exited my side. I don't know how far we had driven, but it wasn't too far before the light slowly began to fade behind us until there were none. I was so relieved to be away from those things, and I took a big breath thinking we were safe. I don't know why I felt there was danger. The lights never harmed us, but it was so strange that it scared both of us anyway. Just about the time that we had settled in for the next 30 miles home, the headlights on the car began to blink on and off and dim. My husband looked at the battery meter in the dash and said the battery was discharging too fast and it was not getting a charge from the alternator. It was dark and we had miles to go and this car was about to quit on us. My husband was smart and he turned everything off that would use battery, including the headlights. He was able to only run the parking light so that we would be visible to other cars, but I didn't think we would see another car this late and on this stretch of road. As we came out of South Fork and headed towards Eden, he had to turn the lights back on to see, but they were very dim. Finally, we were on the last stretch of the road that would take us home. It was an incline down the mountain out of Eden that would take us to the house. The engine finally gave up and we coasted all the way to our drive, almost making it to the house. And we walked the last half mile to the house in what we thought was safety. The next day he replaced the battery and the car started, but there were still problems. Over the next month we had that car in the shop four or five times and all the issues were electrical. 
Circuits were damaged and the car never stopped blowing fuses to every electrical system in the vehicle. It began to get so expensive that we finally sold the car. I think the dark area we saw in the night sky was an alien spacecraft and it sent those lights to our location, causing us all this trouble. I will never forget how those small lights circled in and out of our car. It was so strange. I have several other events I could share with you that involve my family. All my children have been witnesses to most of it, and they have all seen Bigfoot, by the way. Best regards and thanks for your channel. Signed, Diane. Diane, the, that is three or four of the coolest little stories I have heard. I know they all scared you and your husband to death, but that, oh, it was so entertaining, and I just love reading these, and I want to thank you very much. You're 78, and you say you have a hard time writing and even speaking, but I understood exactly what was going on in these stories, and I was able to put them together, and I hope you're happy that I was able to share them with everybody. Thank you very much, Diane. I really appreciate it. Okay, okay, time to do birthdays, and then we're going to wind this thing up. I've got quite a few here, so if you like this birthday thing, hang on. It's really fun for me. It gives me a chance to connect with people in a really different way. I know that it <laughs> some of these people get a kick out of this and it just makes me happy to do it so if you don't like it click away if you like it hang on this is fun let me get my list out all right birthday number one ethan wallace ethan you out there your dad rodney wallace wants to wish you a happy birthday ethan is going to be 16 on september the 24th how you doing ethan are you getting your driver's license I hope so, because if your dad loans that car to you, man, you can start taking girls out on dates, as long as it's okay with them, of course. Ethan, these are the best years of your life, buddy. Don't waste them, and don't get locked down with one girl. Plenty of time for that. You have some fun, man. Happy birthday, Ethan. Paul Stukowski, your twin brother Jamie, says happy birthday. Heck, that means they both have the same birthday. They both turned 51 on August the 15th. Paul, J Jamie's a good brother. Man, that is so nice of him to do. Twins always crack me up. I've known uh, a few twins through my life, and I see some on the internet still, and it always cracks me up how they finish each other's sentences. They tend to dress similar, even as adults. They shave their beards the same, or the women fix their hair the same. It is really so cool. Twins have a really special connection. And Paul and Jamie, happy birthday. You guys are awesome. Next, we have Phil D. from the United Kingdom. Phil's birthday was on September the 10th. I'm not sure how old Phil is, but he wanted to hear me say happy birthday to him. I guess he's wishing himself happy birthday. I think that's cool. Phil D. from the UK. Happy birthday, brother. September 10th. Okay, here's another birthday wish. And uh, some of these, I'm just going to read the email to you because it's just better that way than me making up something to say. But this birthday shout out goes to Brianna Cleveland. She's going to be 18 on, or she was 18 on September the 3rd. Brianna, here's what your dad said in his email. I was hoping you might say happy belated birthday to my daughter, Brianna Cleveland. She turned 18 on September the 3rd. I would have to invent a new language to come up with enough words to describe what an incredible person she is growing into and how much her family loves her. We live in Barron County, Kentucky, pretty much right on top of Mammoth Cave National Park. And I personally had a Sasquatch sighting in 2011, and there's quite a bit of activity around our home. I'll try to find time to put it pen, put pen to paper and share these stories with you. Thanks for your time and greatly enjoy and appreciate your channel. Brianna, your dad loves you. Your dad's proud of you, and he wanted to wish you happy birthday, and so do I. Brianna, 18 years old, again, you have your life ahead of you. Don't get locked down with some dude. You go to school. You have fun. Plenty of time for that. Y'all can tell I'm big on young kids not locking into a, a mate so young. So much to do out there. You guys go have fun. Happy birthday, Brianna. Aaron Fox, your mother Lisa says she wants to say happy birthday to you on September 11th, which was yesterday. I don't know how old Aaron is, but your mom says happy birthday, Aaron. She loves you, buddy. Let me turn to the next page. 
Oh, let's see here. Next, we have Marla. I don't know Marla's last name, but Marla, your fiance, James McKeel, wants to wish you a happy 45th birthday. Marla turned 45 on September the 10th. Okay, I just got a question. You guys are in your 40s, middle age. What the heck are you waiting on? Get down to the courthouse and get married. What's all this fiance stuff? Go to the courthouse and get it done. Spend a weekend at the beach. Come back and get that party started. Go marry that girl, Jeff. But anyway, I'm sorry. James. James wants to wish Marla a happy birthday, and I think that's really nice. Okay, here's an email from Chris Hot. I think that's how you pronounce his name, H-O-T-T. -T. I'm going to read just read his email. He says, my wife, Joanne, thinks I'm a little bit off-center by my interest in Bigfoot. Uh, uh, Chris, so does, I don't know why I want to keep calling everybody Jeff. Chris, my wife thinks I'm a little, I have a screw loose too, so don't worry about it. Your show is not only the one show that she doesn't mind me watching, but the one show that she actually watches with me. We're both fans of the good storytelling. I would appreciate it if you would help a brother out and wish her happy birthday. She will be, uh, let's see, her birthday's on October the 4th. Hopefully she will never question me watching this channel. He says she is 29 and holding 52 if she lets go. Oh, that's awesome. Sounds like a couple that uh, has a lot of fun with each other. So, Joanne, happy birthday. Your husband, Chris, is a great guy. Man, I'm happy for you guys. 52. Don't let go. Don't let go. Okay, next, Sherry Ward. Sherry Ward, are you out there? Your daughter, Addison Hunt, and Sherry Hunt want to wish you a happy birthday on September the 29th. Sherry's going to be 57 years old. I think Sherry is surrounded by people who really love her. It sounds like such a nice family. They live down in Georgia, not far from Atlanta. Addison, her daughter, who's wishing her nene happy birthday, is adopted from a foster care by this sweet couple. I always have a little bit of a thing that sticks in my head all the time, all day long, whenever I'm interacting with other people. And I heard this from a pastor uh, one time, a leader in a church that I was attending, uh, or I kind of learned it from him. I, he didn't come up with these words, but we have, a, we have an opportunity every day with everybody we meet, everybody that we come in contact with to be life to that person, to say something nice, speak life into their day, to breathe life into their week. I mean, we we get to choose to do that, or we, we can just be a, you know, a jerk to people. And I see a lot of people, they just, it's a choice. It really is a choice how you treat other people. And when someone adopts a child out of a foster care system, they are being life to another person. They're taking a person, giving them a home, and giving them so much love that they would otherwise never get. And I'm so proud of this couple for adopting Addison. Addison, you've got some great parents. I think they're I think they're lovely people. And Sherry, happy birthday. Happy 57th birthday on September the 29th. Okay, here's another email that I'm just going to read to you. It's from Sam O'Neill. Sam says, my mother, Anna, is turning another year older. We'll just say she's turning 39 again. And we love listening to your stories after dinner, along with my dad. Your stories help all of us escape the craziness of everyday life and slow down to enjoy the little things. Anna's birthday is September the 23rd, and I'd like to wish her a happy birthday. Please tell her that we love her and thank her for all that she does for us, my dad and I both. And I can't wait to continue listening to Dixie Cryptid videos with her, her, her new guy, with her in her new Gone Squatching T-shirt. Um, apparently, they apparently they bought a T-shirt from our Teespring store. Thank you. Also, I'd like to say happy birthday to my beautiful girlfriend Danielle, who is turning 27 on September the 20th. She is an awesome ICU nurse, and her courage and compassion in the face of this pandemic is inspirational. I just want to say I love her, and I want her to keep kicking butt. Thank you for your time. Health and happiness to you and yours. Keep calm and wear a face mask. Sam, that's awesome. Uh, Miss Anna, who just turned 39 and holding, uh, 
your son wants to wish you happy birthday, and so do I. And also, thank you to Danielle, who's turning 27 on the 20th, for all of your sacrifices and efforts being surrounded by this virus. Every day you go to work, every day, there's hundreds of thousands of people out there on the front lines really fighting this virus, comforting people and being life to other people. Remember I said that a minute ago? They choose their vocation to breathe life into other people, and I love it. I love it. So happy birthday to both of you girls. Next, we have Loretta Riggs, and she wants to say happy birthday to her brother, Willie. Willie's going to be 51 on September the 13th. Loretta says Willie is a firefighter who's been on the job for 29 years. Man, that is awesome. I have some family who are firefighters, so I know what they go through. It's a tough job. Hey, Willie, are you going to retire soon? 29 years, 51 years old? Man, you got a lot of time left. You could do, uh, you could retire and do some other stuff. It's none of my business, but I was just curious. But it is a tough job, and I know all those firemen eat good. My brother-in-law is a fireman, or he was, and he retired, and he's doing something else now. So that's kind of where I got that idea. But I love firemen. Those guys are tough, and they're uh, public servants and they go into the burning buildings and help. They say babies and puppies, man. Love those guys. Happy birthday, Willie. Uh, let's see. Here's an email from Craig Schuler. Craig says uh, his daughter, Kenzie Schuler. I'm assuming her last name is Schuler. Kenzie, you out there? You out there? She's going to be 19th on September the 20th. Here's what he writes. He says, hey, Cam, my name is Craig Schiller. I wanted to tell you that both my daughter and I listen to your channel all the time, and I'm pretty sure that we have listened to every one of your stories. Oh, I can't believe that. That's awesome. We enjoy them in your calm, welcoming voice. We're a couple of your people and very much enjoying listening. Anyway, my youngest daughter is turning 19 on September the 20th, and I thought she would enjoy hearing her happy birthday wishes on your channel because we'll definitely be uh, listening in. Anyway, if you could wish my little Squatch a happy birthday and tell her her daddy loves her bunches, I would appreciate it. Her name is Kenzie, and we live in Missouri. Thanks, and God bless. Well, there you go, Kenzie. Your daddy loves you. Your dad, He's proud of you, and he's uh, wishing you happy birthday, and so am I. Happy birthday, Kenzie. Okay, Cleve Shoot. Cleve, your son Michael wants to wish you happy birthday. Cleve's going to be 80 on September the 18th. And here's here's what your son Michael wrote, Cleve. Could you wish my dad a happy birthday? His name is Cleve, and his birthday is September the 18th. He's going to be 80 this year. He is the best. Between golfing, boating, and driving my Miata, my Mazda Miata, he and my mom stay busy, and they're enjoying their retirement years. I love my dad dearly. Thank you, and keep the awesome stories coming. Signed, Mike Shoup. Cleve, you got a good son there. He's proud of you, and he loves, loves, loves his mom and dad. You guys are lucky to have a son like that. Happy birthday, Cleve. I hope 80 is the best year of all. Last, we have Sherry Davis. Sherry sent an email saying that her father wants to wish his grandson, Riot, a happy fourth birthday. Riot's going to be four on September the 18th. She says, Riot and his pawpaw watch my videos whenever they get together, and they attend the local cryptid events whenever they can. Isn't that cool? Father and uh, grandfather, you know, that's how I got interested in this uh, this Bigfoot storytelling, because uh, I would go pick up my granddaughter and grandson over in Arkansas, bring them back to Mississippi in the summer to stay with us, sometimes all summer long. And we, on the drive over and on the drive back, taking them home, we would listen to the Bigfoot Crossroads uh, Outlaw Radio channel with uh, Matt Knapp and uh, Bear and Kunbo, and we absolutely loved hearing them tell those stories. And that's how I got interested in this. And so I understand the grandparent, the pawpaw, the grandkid relationship, sitting around listening to fun stories. I think it's awesome. So Riot, your grandfather, says happy birthday, four years old on September 18th, man. Four years old. Dude, you're growing up, kid. Happy birthday, Riot. Okay, that's going to do it for the birthdays and the whole video. Thank you guys for hanging through that. These birthdays are getting a little bit long, but I get a lot of them, and I'm just going to keep doing them until I get so many that I just can't. 
uh, I, that I don't have time to put them in a video, but as long as there's, there's about this many per marathon, I'm going to keep doing them. So thank you for watching the video this far. This has been a long video, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you very much for watching.